stop my video. Okay, I think we can start today. We are very happy to have Ning Chang Sung, a postdoc at the Queen University and a Premier Institute. He will talk about the microscopic black holes in the neutrino telescope, GLIDAR, and cosmology. You can start now. Thank you, Dalu, uh, for the opportunity to present uh, my work here. So today I will talk about uh, the microscopic black holes inspired by large extra dimensional models and uh, how they can be detected in neutrino telescopes, colliders, and how, can, how they can affect uh, the cosmological observations. This is based on my work with Aaron Vincent, Katie Mike, and uh, we also have some ongoing work with the postdocs and uh, um, graduate students at uh, Queen's. Uh, all right. Here is the outline. I will give a very brief introduction about uh, the extra dimension, uh, the, the large extra dimension models, and then I will talk about uh, how we can detect uh, microscopic black holes at the neutrino telescopes and how we can uh, discover dark matter and the dark sector through these black holes at the colliders. And after that, I will uh, talk about uh, the the imprints of these microscopic black holes in the early unit in the early universe and uh, i will conclude at the end so the large extra dimension model was proposed by akani hamad demopolis and the valley in 1998 which said that uh, the standard model particles are confined to the three-dimensional brain which means our three-dimensional world including leptons, quarks, Higgs bosons, and uh, Higgs. But uh, gravitons are free to propagate in the bulk, including extra dimensions. So if we look at the Gauss law, we will find uh, the gravitational potential at a really small distance, meaning that the distance is smaller than the size of the extra dimension. The gravitational potential there is proportional to one over the distance to the power of n plus one, where n is the number of extra dimensions. Well, at a really large distance, we um, would expect that the potential is proportional to one over r, as we usually see. So we can different the potentials at the distance equals to the size of the extra dimension. There, we will find our four-dimensional regular Planck scale squared is proportional to the production of the um, bulk Planck scale and the size of the extra dimension to some power, which is related to the number of extra dimension. If the size of the extra dimension r is large enough, the bulk Planck scale m star can be as small as a few TeV, which is uh, not far away from the electroweak scale, and it is much less than the regular Planck scale. So this kind of setup will solve the hierarchy problem. One important implication of this kind of model is the production of microscopic black holes in particle collisions. Who conjecture suggests that um, if the impact parameter in particle collision is smaller than two times the horizon radius of the black hole, a black hole can be formed, which means that uh, we can actually form black hole if we can bring two particles extremely close to each other. This is equivalent to say, if the central mass energy in particle collision is much, much larger, than the bulk Planck scale, we can produce black holes in particle collisions. Um, we can look at possible scenarios, for example, in high-energy particle collisions in, in the neutrino telescopes, if we have really high-energy cosmic neutrino nuclear scattering, we would expect these black holes to be produced there. It can also be produced um, when we detect high-energy cosmic rays, in when the cosmic ray hits the nucleus in the atmosphere, and also in the collision of cosmic cos, um, in the collision of cosmic ray themselves. 
in the future Canada, if the center of mass energy is as high as about, uh, about 100 TV scale, we also expect uh, these macroscopic black holes to be produced in PP collision. In the early universe, if the reheating temperature is high, naturally we also expect uh, these microscopic black holes to be produced in the particle collisions in the hot plasma. Um, to calculate the cross-section, for example, in the PP collision case, we need to integrate over the um, um, pattern distribution functions because we know it is not the protons that are collided together, but it is actually the patterns in the protons that interact with each, with each other. So because black because large actual dimension models predict the production of microscopic black holes, we can um, go back and search for these black holes. For example, in LHC, in that case, we found that uh, the bulk Planck scale has to be larger than 5 to 10 TeV in LHC because we haven't observed any excess and we haven't observed any black holes there. We also have other constraints from the test of gravitational force at a really small distance, the supernova and the neutron star cooling. It was proposed by Akani Hamad in his, in his first papers that uh, one extra dimension is strongly excluded because it will affect the gravity at the solar system scale. It is useful to look at some possible energy scales. If the central mass energy is 5 TeV, which corresponds to the minimum bound that we have from LHC, if we look for such kind of central mass energy in high energy neutrino nuclear scattering, we would expect the neutrino energy to be at least 13 TeV, which means that the neutrino energy has to be higher than that in order to produce black holes in the detect in the neutrino telescope. At LHC, the current central mass energy is 13 PeV. So 13 TeV. In the future, we would expect it to be upgraded, upgraded to a central mass energy to be roughly 100 TeV. A fundamental limit in astrophysical observation is the GZK cutoff, where we expect uh, the energy of the proton to be less than 50 EV. And if we observe such high energy cosmic rays, we would expect that the central mass energy of high energy cosmic ray and proton collision to be about uh, um, of the order of 300 TeV. Once these black holes are formed, they will decay through Hawking radiation. And the decay will be through all kinds of channels. Uh, including standard model particles, like Higgs, gluons, gauge bosons, and um, um, other beyond standard model particles, like gravitons and even dark matter. It is very special um, for gravitons to be emitted because the emission can be into the bulk instead of in the brain, which means that it can be emitted into extra dimensions there, we will certainly not see these gravitons. If we look at the Hawking temperature of these actual dimension black holes, we will find that it is related to the number of extra dimensions, the mass of the black hole, of course, and the, the bulk Planck scale. In the left, I show the Hawking temperature as a function of the black hole mass. If the black hole mass is is much, much higher than the bulk Planck scale, then we expect higher Hawking temperature for larger number of extra dimensions. The thing is opposite if we look at the small mass black holes, where we would expect uh, like n equals one, one extra dimension to have the, high, to have the highest Hawking temperature. The decay 
of the invention of the particles follows the gray body distribution spectrum. And there, the gray body factor is also related to the number of extra dimensions, the spin of the particle and the fundamental scale, so that uh, we have to work out, work out it separately. Okay, after the introduction, I will give uh, some details about how we can discover these black holes in neutrino telescopes. But first, let's look at the high energy neutrino flux. S cube has been operating since 2010, and it has detected a lot of neutrinos above the energy of GeV. And these neutrinos have been used to um, study neutrino oscillation. At high energy, like uh, at the energy above 10 TeV, S cube has also collected uh, a bunch of events. These are called the high energy starting events or HESI events. And uh, we can also look at higher energies, for example, for energy above PeV and even 10 PeV or until the energy of, of 10 EeV. In that case, we don't expect the power law inferred from the S cube um, to be valid anymore because there we also have the uh, resonant production of neutrinos from the collision of high energy cosmic rays of starlight or the collision between high energy cosmic rays and the CMB. But there, the statistics is still really, really low, and the flux is, is too low to be detected at S cube. So there are some proposals to detect these neutrinos in the future. Grand is an option. It has some radio detector in the mountain, which can detect the decay of the tau, of the taus, and these taus will be produced in the tau neutrino charge current interaction in the mountain. Tau's produced in this kind of interaction will exit the mountain and decay in the air to be to produce radio signals to be detected uh, in the in the radio array. I will introduce two other examples. One is S cube generation two. We know S cube is a chunk of detector in the Antarctic to detect um, um, high energy neutrinos. It is really large and it is often compared to the Eiffel Tower to show how large it is. But actually, if we have S cube generation two, it will be 10 times larger than the current S cube detector. S cube generation two will be deplo deployed with the generation two radio array. And um, as you can see from these figures below, the generation two radio array is much, much higher it's much, much larger than the generation two detector. And again, it is much larger than S cube. Another, another example is the Pacific Ocean Neutrino Experiment or the P1 experiment. Um, it is planned um, neutrino detector in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Vancouver. And it is partly sponsored by McDonald Institute here. It uh, has similar detection techniques as S cube, but also it has larger exposure. Depending on the production mechanism of these high energy neutrinos, the neutrino flavor composition and the source can be very different. If these neutrinos come from um, neo neutron decay, we would expect only electron neutrinos at the source. So the flavor ratio of electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino would be one zero zero. If neutrinos come from pion and muon decay chain, we would expect the flavor ratio to be one to zero. And if they come from muon suppressed pion decay, we expect only muon neutrinos at the source. But regardless of the production mechanism and the flavor composition at the source, these neutrinos have to, under, have to undergo neutrino oscillation before they arrive at the Earth. And uh, along this really long trip, they will lose their coherence. Because these neutrino oscillation parameters are relatively well constrained by all kinds of Earth 
um, neutrino oscillation experiments, we expect the neutrino flavor composition at the Earth to be constrained to a very narrow island. And the, the neutrino flavor composition at the Earth will not be very far from the equal flavor ratio, the one one the one 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 flavor ratio. In the detector, we don't see these neutrinos directly, but we see their interaction products. Um, one example is the muon neutrino track events. It is produced from muon neutrino charged current interaction, where we have the muon neutrino interacting with the protons or the neutrons, and uh, the muon neutrino is converted into a muon. The nucleus is fragmented into a bunch of hadrons. These hadrons will initiate some kind of shower, and these muons will escape the detector. When the muons travel outside the detector, they will lose their energy stochastically. So we will see a long tail, long tail in the detector. This is named the track events. In SQ, this kind of tracks can also be produced in tau neutrino charged current interaction when we have a tau in the final state. But this tau has to be very energetic so that these taus can leave the detector and, and the decay outside of the detector. Because tau is more massive than muon, so we expect uh, the stochastic energy loss of the tall particle is less than muon. So the track is more faint than the muon track. Um, the other topology is the shower events. It can be produced in electron neutrino charged current events and the neutral current events in from all kinds of from all flavor of neutrinos. And it is shown as a spherical blob. And uh, the signal will expand from the interaction vertex outwards as the time goes on. Tau neutrino charged current can also produce this kind of signature if it is not very energetic, and the tau decays immediately after the first interaction vertex. If the tau, the final state tau, is very energetic, it can travel a certain distance before it decays. In that case, if it decays to electron or hadrons, this final state electron or hadrons will initiate a second shower that can be separated from the first shower. In that case, we see two bands. This is the so-called double band events. These are the events Hi. we would expect. Hello? Can I ask a question? Hello. Yeah, sure. Can I to go to the previous slide? Uh, this slide? Yeah, so the, the tracks and the showers, sorry, what's the difference between tracks and the showers? So the tracks will be really, really long. Uh, that it, it, can, it can last from the interaction vertex until the muon leaves the, the detector. So it will be from somewhere in the detector until the, the edge of the detector we will see some very long strip. But for the showers, it is almost spherically symmetric, and it is just some blob, as you can see here. It is limited in the, in, it is limited to some, to certain um, space points of the space region of the detector. It is not as long as the, at the track, but most importantly, it is very spherical, it's magic, and we can even build some quantity to, um, to quantify like uh, how spherical, how spherical it is to see whether it is a shower or it is a track. But yeah. uh, in reality, um, there, it will be difficult, I would say, to, to distinguish um, standard model showers and the tracks because the tracks can also happen like um, um, near the edge of the detector. So we can build some likelihood to say what is the probability that this event observed is a shower and what is the probability that uh, it is a track. Okay, 
So then you're saying for the mu neutrino charge current, you you more likely observe tracks for for electron neutrino, you are more exactly observe showers. So is it because of the mass of the muon is larger than the electron? So why the mass play the uh, role? Okay, so for electrons, for electrons in the final states, this will be produced in electron neutrino uh, charge the current events. Then the final state will be electrons. And then these electrons will interact with the nucleus in the, in the SQB detector. And the interaction is really, really strong because it has uh, it's hydronic process, it's, it is some QCD process. So in that case, the, the stopping length of these electrons are really, really tiny. So we expect uh, the showers to be produced in, the, in a very limited space. But for muons, producing the muon neutrino charge current event, these muons only lose their energy stochastically and, it, and they interact very weakly with the nuclei. That's why they can leave the detector and uh, we see some tracks there. Okay, thank you. No problem. Okay, I think, I think we're here. So in the previous slides, I showed uh, that we can um, produce shower track and double bond topologies in standard model events. If we can produce a black hole, the black hole can decay into all kinds of particles, including electron muon and the tau. So we expect all these standard model topologies to be produced in the black hole event. And then the, now the question is, what is the prob probability to produce these black holes and how that can be compared with the standard model cross-section. In this figure, I show the um, black hole production cross-section um, assuming different bulk Planck scale. We see if the bulk Planck scale is 3 keV, then the black hole production cross-section can be comparable or even larger than the standard model cross-section. But if the bulk Planck scale is 10 keV, it is always much smaller than the standard model cross-section, no matter how large the neutrino energy is. From these observations at S cube, we can possibly reconstruct the flavor composition at the Earth based on the check shower and the double bound observations. Here to show how the black hole production can change the reconstruction, we assume the bulk Planck scale to be 3 TV. And if we look at the table below, we will see that the um, number of shower chunk events will be much larger than the standard model case from the same flux, but it will have less double bound events. This is due to the energy asymmetry condition, which I will explain in a moment. We have more tracks because we have more muons and tiles from the from black hole decays. All these will drive the contours, the reconstructed reconstructed contours to be in the upper right corner of the flavor triangle. The flavor triangle is constructed by the fraction of the electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. So if we compare with the standard model case, especially if we look at the one 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 flavor ratio, we will see that this kind of equal flavor ratio is excluded at more than two sigma confidence level. But actually, as I mentioned in the previous slides, the LHC observation would exclude the bulk Planck scale to be above 10 to up to 10 keV, depending on the number of extra dimensions. In that case, we would expect the black hole production cross-section to be much, much lower. Uh, well, not so much lower, but lower than the standard model case. So now the question is, 
If you don't observe so many events, if we just observe one event, how can we tell from this one event whether it is from black hole production or it is just from standard model interaction? For that, we can look at the differential cross section. In this figure, I show the differential cross section in the standard model case where it is plotted against a quantity y, and y is defined as one minus the final state laptop divided by the incoming neutrino energy. The figure is on log scale, so we expect the cross-section to peak at really large um, final state laptop energy and a very small y. This means that in the standard model case, most of the incoming neutrino energy is transferred to the final state lepton on neutrinos. We expect it is transferred to neutrinos because in neutral kind of interaction, we would expect the neutrino to stay as it is in uh, standard model interactions. Sorry, can I, can uh, I this, this is Marcus, can I ask you to go back just one slide from this one here? Um, should have asked this here, but you know, you did. You said that the standard model prediction of uh, equal flavors is very insensitive to uh, to the initial um, flavor composition. Um, well, I just wonder, but I I didn't realize that the standard model was here, you know, excluded <laughs> at two sigma. So I have to ask, uh, you know, is is uh, I, I, as far as I know, we don't really understand the origin of cosmic rays or the origin of very high energy neutrinos. So if I pushed on that and I just said, suppose you could have any flavor, initial flavor composition you wanted, anything, no matter how crazy it is. Could you get closer to the standard model with some crazy assumption about the initial flux? The flavor content? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, so first of all, just to make it clear, if you look at the blue, blue contour, which is the standard model contour here, yeah. it is really narrow. And uh, there we actually assume all kinds of flavor composition, any flavor composition. But because of neutrino oscillation, the final flavor composition we get at the Earth is, re is this really tiny island. But uh, for this standard model plus black hole case, we actually only assume there is, um, that we start from one, one, one equal flavor ratio and how we can reconstruct right. it at the Earth. So in that case, in that case, uh, you are right. We can certainly uh, assume we start from different flavor composition and we see how these contours would change. And uh, indeed, we would expect uh, these contours to change because there the standard model observations would change. From standard model, um, of, from standard model um, interactions, we would expect a different shower check and double bounce if we start from different flavor composition. But most importantly, the black hole, the black hole production is insensitive to the initial um, neutrino flavor, whether it is electron neutrino, muon neutrino, or tau neutrino, and it will always produce a black hole, the same black hole, and this black hole will decay yeah. into a. No, I, I understand that. I guess I guess I just really so this just to be clear, I just wanted to make sure I understand about the standard model first. I mean, the the blue contour is really allowing let's say 100% tau, whatever, literally any composition you want. Right, right. Okay. And literally any flavor composition. Literally anything. Purely, purely electron neutrino, purely muon neutrino, purely tau neutrino. Okay. Because of the uh, neutrino flavor composition, which I show. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Flavor oscillation, which well, I show. Yeah, mixed. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. 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 OK, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Okay, where we are. I guess we're here. So uh, in the standard model case, I just showed that the final states and uh, um, lepton or neutrino will be very energetic and they carry most of the incoming neutrino energy 
but the things are very different in the black hole case. Because for the black hole, it will decay into like six, six to 20 particles on average. And in that case, we would expect uh, the final state lepton to be only one of the decay products. So its energy will uh, be proportional to one over n, and the n is the number of particles that black hole decays into. So compare this with the standard model case, we would say the lepton energy in black hole case is much smaller than in the standard model case. This will allow us to distinguish standard model events and black hole events in all kinds of topologies. First, we can look at the muon tracks. On the left, I show the muon energy as a function of the shower energy. I did a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations um, for standard model case and for black holes, assuming different bulk plant scale. We see the standard model events are located on the uh, in the upper left, and the black holes are located uh, in the upper, in the lower right. So they are cl clearly separable from each other, which means that in the standard model case, the muon energy is higher than the hydrogen energy, which initiates the, the small top, the small shower in the track. But in the black hole case, the hydrogen energy is supposed to be larger than the muon energy because muon is only one of the black hole decay products. The upshot is that uh, we expect a lower track energy to shower energy ratio in black hole events than in the standard model case. We can also look at the double one events. This, as I mentioned before, this is produced in tau neutrino charged current events. When the tau when the final state tau is very energetic, it travels a certain distance, and then as it decays in the detector, to produce a second shower. But uh, um, most importantly, in the standard model case, the tau is much more energetic than the um, than the hadrons from the fragmentation of the nucleus from the first shower. So we expect the second shower to be more energetic than the first shower. But in the black hole case, it is the opposite because tau is only one of the decay products. So the second, the second shower is fainter or smaller than the first shower. This will allow us to define the energy asymmetry factor Ea, which is the energy the energy of the first shower minus the energy of the second shower, then divided by the total shower energy. In the standard model case, certainly we would expect uh, the first shower energy to be uh, to be lower than the second shower energy, and the, the black holes predict the opposite. So on the left, if I really plot the second band, the, or the second shower energy as a function of the first shower energy. We see standard model particle, standard model events on the one side and the black hole um, events on the other side. So this is very interesting, and uh, that's why when we um, apply the energy asymmetry condition in the standard model case, we would expect the black hole events don't fit into this picture. And that's why we expect so few several events in, in black hole production case. If I were to make some analogy, this is uh, like some, some ice cream chocolate bar and uh, there are some candies on the chocolate, chocolate skin and uh, these candies are uh, black holes with different uh, bulk time scale. Okay, just a small joke. Now if we look at uh, the histogram of the EA factor, we will see that the, the standard model events are on the left and the black hole events are on the right, which means that we expect mostly negative energy asymmetry in the standard model case and mostly positive um, NG asymmetry in the black hole production case. 
In the previous slides, I talked about track topology and uh, double band topology. And, uh, the majority part of the events are showers. So how can we distinguish black hole showers from the standard model showers? Excuse me. That, Sorry, excuse me. I, I, again, can I, can I can we go back just one slide? Maybe you, maybe you said this, but um, are you assuming a spectrum for the neutrinos or are the, is the total energy actually measured from the total energy of the event or something? So what I'm wondering is if this energy difference between black holes and standard model could be faked by having the wrong spectrum. So, right, this is, a, this is indeed a very good question. And uh, um, in our analysis, actually, we have, we have assumed a certain, um, certain neutrino flux, some kind of power law with some spectral index. And if you look at uh, this figure, for example, we plot the second power, second shower energy versus the first shower energy. And we see almost uh, in our case, we expect uh, the standard model to be on one side and the black hole to be on the other side. And you see these different dots correspond to different neutrino energies. And regardless of the neutrino energy, we would expect mo most of the case, black holes would have a, a positive energy asymmetry, uh, and energy asymmetry factor, and the standard model would have a negative energy asymmetry. This is indeed just because black holes can decay into many different products, and the second shower is just the one of the decay products. So regardless of the neutrino energy, we would always expect uh, this kind of this kind of feature, just because the um, different uh, energy distribution in the standard model case and in the black hole case. Yeah, it just makes it hard to know how to, uh, you know, if you have a very dramatic uptick, I'm sure you could claim there was new physics, right? But where you would set a bound if you don't see something is maybe not so clear, right? Maybe. Well, what we what we can say is that if we observe so so many events, in that case, what um, in that case, how can we say we have discovered the black holes or not? Whether or not there is new physics, even if it is not black holes. So for that, we really have to um, look at the, the feature of these new physics, of these, of these black hole events, right? And uh, if we clearly see some different uh, energy, energy distribution, like the energy symmetry condition based on a few events, actually we can roughly, um, roughly reconstruct the energy of the neutrino just from the observation like from the, if it is a black hole, we know the neutrino will deposit almost all its energy in the detector. So we can collect this chunk of light and say, what is the energy of the neutrino? But in that case, we, we can actually determine the neutrino energy in this kind of scenario. And uh, if we have this, if we can determine the neutrino energy, we know what energy the event is. And we, we see, this kind of energy asymmetry. And we can do simulation to say, if we have black hole production, what is the probability to see such kind of energy asymmetry? And if the probability is really high, but uh, the standard model, but uh, the probability to be interpreted by the standard model is really low, we can claim that we discover black hole to some significant level, right? Can I, can I ask another naive question? I, I don't know very much about ice cubes. So the, all the other decay products of the black holes that are not neutrinos, you can't see them at all in ice cube? I, actually, actually, this is a very good question and I will explain that in a few slides. Actually, oh, yeah. 
okay. uh, in the next slide. <laughs> okay, I'm glad I asked. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. So, for that, we need to look at several events actually. The one important information would be the Chankov lights uh, echo information. Um, so, we would expect uh, the interaction products from neutrino nuclear scattering to deposit their energy promptly within 0.1 microseconds. And this will be the prompt shower, the dominant shower that we will see in the S cube detector. And then these high energy particles will cascade down to like uh, um, muons and, uh, and the neutrons. These particles, these muons and neutrons will, uh, will be, um, will have very low energy and, and the muons will decay at uh, one to 10 microseconds, producing a secondary neuron um, decay echo. And the neutrons will be captured at about 200 microseconds, producing a third, not so large, uh, neutron capture echo. And to answer your question, actually we have simulated a bunch of particles, like pions, protons, neutrons, kions, electrons, positrons, and, uh, and uh, photons. We simulated the, the propagation of these, these particles in the S, like in a cube detector, and we collect these chunk of light to see what is the time spectrum of these, of these particles. So you may wonder if we really have all these decay products, like we have some quarks in the final space, what do they look like in each, in S cube? Of course, black holes can produce these particles, but these particles, because uh, QCD is a confined theory. So they, even if you emit a quark, that means it will hydrogenize immediately and then produce a bunch of hydrons or even like pounds or kinds of protons or neutrons. These particles will propagate and because these, these particles will under will go through hydronic interactions, they will be stopped immediately and cascaded down to low energy particles, low energy neurons and neutrons. And this will be, um, uh, this will decay or, or captured to produce the secondary peaks. So overall, we will still see a shower, some shower signature. One important uh, exception is that uh, if in the hydrogenization, fragmentation, and the decay, if we can still pro if we can still produce high energy muon or high energy tau from these quarks and um, etc., then we would expect to uh, check our double bond signature. We did some simulation, Monte Carlo simulation, to see what is the probability of all these processes. Does that answer your question? Oh, sorry, you're on your <laughs> I guess. Okay, I guess I will continue. And if you are, if you are still confused, we can discuss that later. So um, from, this, from this simulation, we see that uh, these primary particles can be categorized in two groups. One is uh, like uh, electron, positron, and photons, which, which will produce um, electromagnetic showers. These particles will cascade down to less muons and neutrons in the final space. Um, and the other group are hydrons, including pions, photons, neutrons. And these hydrons will produce a bunch of muons and the neutrons in the final phase. So if we compare these two spectrum, we will see that uh, the hydronic shower produced by hydrons um, is much, much higher than the, than the electromagnetic shower produced by electron positron and the gammas. And the amplitude of the, of the muon echo and the neutron echo in the hydronic shower case is roughly 10 times the amplitude of the electromagnetic shower. 
and also the muon echo and the neutron echo are closely correlated. So if we figure out one, we can um, immediately get that just from the correlation. This kind of separation will allow us to separate them different interaction channels. If we look at the neutral current events, it is the product the product of the interaction are mostly hydrons. So we would expect a very high neutron echo or muon echo. So if we look at this figure where I show where I show the third to first peak ratio as a function of the first peak energy. The peak ratio in the neutral current interaction case is really, really large. The electron neutrino charge the current is opposite because we expect high energy electron to be produced in the interaction, and the, the shower will be almost purely electromagnetic, and the peak ratio will be low. For black holes, the decay will be a combination of um, electron positrons and hadrons. So we expect uh, the peak ratio to lie in between neutral current interaction and the electron neutrino charge current events. And uh, very importantly, if we can produce black holes, that means the black hole can deposit almost all its energy in the detector. So we expect a higher first peak than the standard model case. Um, previously, I mentioned that uh, the standard model shower check and the bubble events can all be produced in the black hole case. But the black hole can decay into multiple particles. So can we expect uh, more and new topologies at the ice cube like detectors? The answer is yes. I will give some examples here. If the black holes can decay into multiple muons or multiple tiles, they will leave some tracks in the detector. This is um, something called the multi track event. And if the black holes can decay into multiple tiles, this tile decay in the detector will see several showers. If these showers can be separated from each other, we can call it uh, the n band event. If the multiple tau decays are associated with a muon or tau track, we see something similar to a cloud. If one of the black hole decay product is energetic enough to produce another black hole, we see two black holes in the detector, which is fantastic, and we call it a double black hole band. The observation of one of those events will indicate the production of the black holes, it will be some smoking gun evidence because we don't expect these topologies to be produced in the standard model interactions. So based on this uh, information, we would question what is the probability to um, to discover or exclude black hole production based on certain amount of observations. Of course, if we detect or if we observe one of these, one of these new topologies, we'll be very excited because we already know we have discovered black holes. But if we just uh, observe the standard model shower check and the double one events, in that case, how can we say whether or not we have discovered a black hole? For that, we did some analysis and uh, I show a flow chart of our analysis here. We start from high energy cosmic neutrinos. These neutrinos may impact in the detector to produce random model products or to produce a black hole. If a black hole is produced, we will use black max to simulate the production and the decay of these black holes. And the black hole decay products are fed into KCA to simulate the 
heterogenization, fragmentation, and the decay of these um, products. In the standard model case, we will calculate the differential cross section, and then we will do some Monte Carlo simulation to see what the, is the energy distribution of the final state particles. And this and again, we use PCR to simulate the, the heterogenization of these particles. Then we will be able to determine whether it will produce a track, a shower, or a double band. If checks or double bonds are produced, we will go ahead and calculate the check to shower energy distribution of the energy asymmetry factor. If a shower is produced, the situation is a little bit more complicated. We need to use Fluca to simulate the propagation of these um, final state particles. And then we will be able to extract the timing information and calculate the neutron echo and the muon echo from there. Based on these, we will be able to build some likelihood to tell the difference between black hole events and the standard model events with these energy distributions. And then we will be able to collect with certain number of observations can we discover or exclude the production of black holes? The results are shown in this figure where I plot the number of observations required to discover black hole at a certain confidence level, assuming certain Planck scale. We can focus on the crossing points between the S cube generation two line, the P1 line, and these blue lines. At the three sigma confidence level, we can see if the bulk Planck scale is smaller than 5 keV, we will be able to discover black holes at S cube generation two. And if the bulk Planck, the bulk Planck scale is less than 7 keV, we will be able to see it in P1 detector. Of course, if we have larger detectors to detect more neutrinos and if we have more observations, we can push the limit further and further. But keep in mind here, we only include the analysis of shower track and double bond events. The observation of even one new topology would indicate the production of the black hole in the future in a future detector. Okay, I've done with um, black holes at the neutrino telescopes. Next, I will talk about uh, dark matter at the colliders and how we can discover them through the production of black holes there. Mm, we have a bunch of evidence um, about the dark matter and uh, almost, uh, I would not say all of them, but most of them come from cosmological and astrophysical observations. We can infer the property of dark matter from these observations, like the bullet cluster from the galaxy rotation curve and from the CMD and astrophysics. We know dark matter makes up about 27% uh, of the total energy budget of the universe. And of all the matter, about 87% of the matter is dark matter. And dark matter is weakly impacting at a relatively large scales. And if the dark matter is fermion, we would expect uh, their mass to be larger than 100 to 200 electron volts because of the Pauli exclusion principle. And if they are bosons, we expect uh, the mass to be higher than 10 to the minus 22 to 10 to the minus 20 electron volts based on the observation of the halo structure. Based on these um, constraints, we have many different dark matter candidates. If the dark matter is heavier than the sun, it could be primordial black holes that live until now. If they're really, really light, they could be ultra-light ultra -light dark matter, like fuzzy dark matter. If it is a little bit heavier, it can be QCD axions. If it is between GeV and TeV, or even heavier than that, 
as it could be wind, although it is largely excluded as a direction, direct detection experiment of asymmetric dark matter. We have some exciting news from the Zena One um, collaboration, who has who has reported the excess of electron recoil events in the energy range of one to seven kV. Now, over the last two to three months, there has been more than um, more than eighty papers trying to explain the excess, and the number of papers is still growing. These interpretations include the neutrino magnetic moments and the mass and the neutrino interactions, although they are subject to astrophysical and cosmological constraints. And people also propose the, the axions and the dark photons produced in the sun, but uh, they might be in tension with the stellar cooling bond. We have some um, recent papers trying to circumvent that bond. And uh, we can also interpret this as axion like particles or dark photon if they are dark matter while being consistent with all the existing bonds. Um, some, some others also propose the boosted dark matter. Bermanti and I mentioned one probability, which one possibility, which is ex exothermic dark matter. Dark matter, which can bounce together in the detector and produce this kind of excess. I will not, not talk about the detail here, but the, the point I want to make is that almost apart from this zeno one excess and the other indirect hints for dark matter, almost all the evidence of the dark matter are from the from a gravitational interaction. So there still exists the possibility of the nightmare scenario where dark matter and the standard model only interact through gravitational interactions. So here I want to show, even in this case, we can still probe particle dark matter in future colliders if we assume large extra dimensions exist. This is a previous slide where I showed that uh, if we squeeze a really small amount of energy in a small region, we can produce microscopic black holes. And that may happen in future colliders if the central mass energy is as high as 100 GeV. These black holes can decay into all kinds of particles, including neutrinos, gravitons, and the dark matter. These particles, these neutrinos, graviton, and dark matter, because they are very weakly interacting, they may not even see in the future colliders. So they, including dark matter, will contribute to the missing transverse momentum. From that, actually, we can, we have a possibility to detect these dark matter particles and the colliders. I give some example of the dark sector here. If you have one dark matter degree of freedom, the dark matter could be a scalar. If you have four degree of freedom, it can be direct fermions. Um, if you have 20 degree of freedom in the dark sector, we can build a very simple dark sector with fermions and dark photons, etc. If you have 118 degree of freedom, the dark sector could be a copy of the standard model, like the mirror dark, mirror dark sector. We can define a very useful quantity, which is the fraction of the invisible decay. This is defined as the degree of, free, degree of freedom of neutrinos, gravitons, and dark matter divided by the total degree of freedom of the particles. If we have more degree of freedom in the dark sector, we would expect the invisible decay fraction to increase. But we also expect a larger fraction of the invisible decay if we have more extra dimensions. That is because gravitons can be emitted to the bulk. So we have more degree of freedom for gravitons in that case. 
at the LHC and the LHC like like a colliders, we can distinguish black holes and the standard model background by looking at uh, the transverse momentum information. Um, as we can see from the mm -hmm. lower right panel, we see black holes are clearly separated from the background in the high multiplicity and the high transverse momentum region. So if we include the dark matter, if we include the dark, dark matter as decay production, if we produce black holes, we can count the distribution of the missing transverse momentum at the future colliders. And we see if we have more and more dark matter degree of freedom, the mean missing transverse momentum also rises sharply. And uh, if we compare this with the standard model case, which is the colored line, we see that uh, they can be more and more the distribution can be more and more separated from the standard model distribution. By standard model, I mean the dark the black hole only decays into standard model particles, but not to, to dark matter. From the distribution of the missing transverse momentum, we can build the likelihood and uh, and say. Uh, how many black hole observations are required to resolve the dark sector. We see different bands here correspond to different dark matter degree of freedom. On the right, we see if we have four degree of freedom in the dark sector, which where dark matter can be fermions, we would need 10,000 black holes to probe the dark sector. But if we have 118 degree of, degree of freedom in the dark sector, we will only need 100 black holes there to resolve the dark sector. But in any case, regardless of the degree of freedom, we only need a very limited number of black hole observations in order to probe the signature of these dark matter particles. They are all well within the luminosity range of that of future collider. Mm. I would mention one exception, to be honest, where we only have one dark matter degree of freedom. And there, we will need a really, really large amount of black hole observations. And probably that can still escape the um, detection um, ability of future collider. Uh, sorry, uh, a simple question for the for the previous slides. Sure. Yeah, you're assuming the FCC, uh, assume it's 100 TV proton proton collider, right? Right. And uh, uh, one curious thing, uh, one thing I'm interested in is what about the, suppose you have 30 TV, uh, like a electron or muon collider. So, it will comparable to 100 TV collider or it's not, it's not, just a... Uh... Um, good question. Actually, a 30, a 30 TV collider would be enough, I would say, because scale, we assume the, Planck, the bulk Planck scale to be 10 TV, and uh, uh, these results are overturned uh, from simulation, assuming that bulk Planck scale. So even if we only have a 30 TV collider, we can still produce these black holes if we have 10 TV box Planck scale. And if the luminosity is high enough, we will be able to collect enough black hole events to really resolve the dark sector and uh, determine the, path, the property of these dark matter particles. Okay. okay. Um, great, so far so good. Um, Finally, I will talk about the, the production of these black holes in the early universe. So if the reheating temperature in, in the early universe is not far below the bulk Planck scale, we know these, we have the Boltzmann distribution of these particles. At the tail of the Boltzmann distribution, we would expect some high energy particles. And these particles 
would collide and produce a bunch of black holes in the very early universe. But these black holes are very different from the black holes that, that we may or may not see in neutrino telescopes or in future colliders. The difference is that uh, these black holes are immersed in the hot plasma, so we would expect these black holes to accrete radiation from the plasma if the Hawking temperature is, is lower than the temperature of the plasma. On the left, I show the black hole mass as a function of the temperature of the universe. We see that the black hole accretion is almost instantaneous, and it grows almost immediately from a really, really tiny microscopic black hole right above the Planck scale, the bulk Planck scale, to be very massive black holes and as heavy as 10 to the 20 grams. And the final black hole mass after accretion only depends on the, um, the plasma temperature when it is produced. Of course, it uh, also depends on the bulk Planck scale the number of actual emissions. On the right, I show an <coughs> sorry, I show an example of the differential spectrum of the um, the differential mass spectrum of these black holes. So these black holes, as I showed before. They have different Hawking temperatures than four-dimensional black holes. So certainly we would expect their lifetimes to be very different from four-dimensional black holes. In this figure, the dashed line shows the regular four-dimensional black hole, and the colored lines show the lifetime of the black, black holes, assuming different number of actual dimensions. We see most of the time the lifetime of the black holes in extra dimensions are longer than the lifetime of the, of the 4D black holes. Once these black holes are formed and they finish a creation, they will decay into all kinds of particles, uh, including photons um, and all kinds of uh, standard model emis emissions. So if we have photon and the primary or secondary product, they will change the extragalactic photon background. And these photons in the X-ray and the gamma ray range, and range can be detected by Comptel or Fermi light. Um, on the top, I show the fraction of the dark matter as a function of the black hole mass for four-dimensional regular black holes. And uh, in the bottom, I show the case if we have um, extra dimensional black holes with different number of extra dimensions. So we see some peak here, or the tightest constraint, which corresponds to these black holes that uh, live right until today. This would correspond to the lifetime of the black holes that that uh, is comparable to the lifetime the I'm not say the lifetime the uh, the duration from reheating until now because the Hawking temperature is different and the lifetime of the black holes are different if we assume different number of actual dimensions so we we certainly expect this uh, this constraints to be picked at the different positions corresponds to those black holes that evaporate right, right until today. And the, these constraints are also shifted if we compare those with four-dimensional black holes. This is from Johnson's paper and we did a similar, we did a, some analysis and we also got very similar results. Another example of cosmological constraints is the CND observations. Black holes can decay into all kinds of particles and inject its energy into the plasma. This will, act, this will effectively increase the free electron fraction and it will increase 
the Thompson scattering along the lamp site for CMD photons. So if we look at uh, the CMD multiples, especially high multiple uh, astrophysics, as we can see on the left, where I plot uh, the CMD spectrum relative to the case where we have a very, very small fraction of black holes. So we see as the fraction of the dark matter increases, the isotopy at uh, high multiples actually decreases. So from that, we, we can constrain the fraction of the black holes based on, on the observation of CMD high multiples. We implement uh, this, we implement the decay of these actual dimension black holes in a modified version of Axel class. And this is interfaced uh, with Mount Python to infer the posterior probability distribution of these of the black hole fraction. On the right, I show one example where we have a 10 to the 14 gram black hole in four extra dimensions and the bulk Planck scale is 10 dB. We see in this case, a fraction of 10 to the minus seven is strongly excluded. In the future, we will run more points, we will vary the black hole mass, the number of extra dimensions, the bulk Planck scale to see where the constraints are. Okay, great. So I will conclude in this final slide. I talked about uh, how we can discover microscopic black holes and the future neutrino telescopes. These are featured with unusual reconstructed flavor composition and uh, different event top different event energy distribution in all topologies. We also expect uh, very new and exciting event topologies at H cube generation two or P1. In the future, we can look at uh, the video telescopes or Cherenkov telescopes, which can um, detect uh, the production of these black holes in high energy proton uh, collision with the atmosphere, for example. Uh, I also talk about how we can discover dark matter at future colliders through the missing transverse momentum signature. Um, we have some ongoing work uh, focusing on the dark matter mass and the spin because the dark matter mass and the spin will affect the gray body spectrum, which is the emission probability of the dark matter particles. Lastly, I mentioned briefly the black hole production in the early universe. Very different from the microscopic black holes at the neutrino telescopes and colliders, these black holes can occur to be to be very massive after their microscopic production. And they can decay into all, all kinds of particles to change the um, photon, actual galactic photon background, the CMB surface, BBN, and the, the galactic. Uh, Electron spectrum, proton spectrum, uh, etc. We will we we have some ongoing work looking at all these cosmological constraints. But um, we can what we can also do is to is to look back from these cosmological observations. How can we constrain the bulk Planck scale and the, the number of extra dimensions? One very interesting idea is that uh, if these black holes can decay into dark matter, can this dark matter be part of all the dark matter? And can they make up all the dark matter relic abundance? If the black hole evaporation stops at the bulk Planck scale, would these Planck remnants behave as dark matter? And would they constitute uh, Parts of all the dark matter that we can that we have in the in the universe today. Okay, so I'll now and then I'll take more questions. Thank you. We can give you a applause. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.
So any question? Yeah, if there's no question, I think we can go to a discussion session. Yeah.